I'll invite you to grab your Bibles, and you can open them with me to the book of Judges, chapter 2. And I'll just say, as, we, as we're turning there, I, I think that hymn is becoming just more and more one of my favorite hymns. I feel like I say that a lot, but uh, just all the more that's, I don't know, just been a very meaningful hymn to me because it's, it's a hymn where the church is singing, almost in the voice of Christ, the promises that Christ makes to us, right? That's a hymn that's loaded with some really rich and deep biblical promises. Uh, and I just take great comfort in those promises. And it's under those promises now that we come to God's word and we submit to that word, praying that he will remake us and uh, lead us in obedience to that word, all under the promises that he, he gives to us. So if you, again, if you have your Bibles, I'll be in the book of Judges and we're going to start uh, chapter two, beginning in verse six. So when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel, each went to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years old. And they buried him within the boundaries of his, of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And that people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. This is the reading of God's word for us this morning, and we pray that uh, his spirit would not only give us eyes to see and ears to hear, but hearts that are willing to be submissive to it. And uh, with that, you may be seated. So again, I mentioned last week that uh, we often do this at the end of the summer. We just kind of take the last couple weeks of the summer as we head into, you know, gearing back up with the fall and all the fall programs and ministries that are going on. Sometimes we just like to take these last couple weeks and just remind ourselves from Scripture why it is we do some of the things that we do, right? So in years past, we sometimes have like gone over you know, from First Peter, what it means to be the church of Christ and what we're called to do together. Uh, and this year, uh, we're just looking at particular aspects of the life of Grace Church and just highlighting from Scripture why we do some of the things we do just so that we're all on the same page. And we remember that and we go at these things uh, not, only, not only with passion, but also just with real intentionality as well, too. And so if you were to actually go down the steps and you would turn left and go down to the, to the gym, as you're walking down that hallway... Right, you might see, I don't know, a year or two ago, we, we put these big um, poster blocks on the, on the wall there. Uh, and the intent was to highlight what we consider here like a pathway of discipleship at Grace Church. So if you're walking down that hallway, you're actually walking past, you know, the programs of our pathway to discipleship. Or the programs, the program that we're offering that we're, through which we're trying to grow up together into Christ. All right, so the first block would be the Lord's Day worship, where we come together and we declare the goodness of God and his promises and we sit under his word. All right, then you, you might have then the block that talks about our grace groups, right, where you gather with a group of people who you can be a little bit more open with about the things that are going on in life, how God is at work in your life, and we, we confess our need of God together and we pray for one another, hold each other accountable, all that. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, and then we also have a block in there where we talk about how it's part of our discipleship to cultivate in you the gifts that the Spirit has given to you and create opportunities for you to use those gifts in service both to one another and to our community. All right, and we looked at one of those new opportunities last week. Okay, but then there's this, this fourth block in there. And uh, this one, I don't know if we would necessarily consider it part of our pathway of discipleship for adults anyway, but it's such a vital and central and foundational part of who we are as Grace Church that we felt like that just had to be on that wall. And that is our ministry to children and youth. 
Right? Long before I got here, uh, Grace Church had a long history, a long-standing reputation of investing a lot in caring for and nurturing and raising up the young people that God had entrusted to our, to our care and that God had asked us to shepherd and to care for. Right? And so this morning, as that's such a central part of who we are as a church, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about why that is so important. I spent a little bit of time looking from the scriptures on just this business of ministering to kids. I'm going to talk a little bit to parents. But I'm going to talk more to all of us. Uh, and I'm also going to have maybe a little word at the end just for the young people as well, too. And uh, just before we dive into all that, I just wanted to say, you know, I hope this is just very simple, obvious reminders. And sometimes pastors or preachers, you know, we think, oh, I got to bring something deeply profound, you know, to, to the congregation. I have to make some profound application of the text. I don't know where that comes from. Don't worry. That is what it is. Well, I, I deal with that on my... But the point is that I don't think there's anything profound here this morning. I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you are just very simple reminders that we need to regularly be reminded about. Or in other words, I'm sharing with you things that myself, as a member of Grace Church, and myself as a father of kids spanning 5 to 17, right? Things that I, reg I know in my head already, but that I, I regularly need to be reminded of, challenged by, and held accountable to, okay? So that's what we're doing. And to get us into that, uh, I thought we'd work through the book of Judges a little bit here this morning. I don't know if it's because... I don't know, we were in the period of the judges last week working through the book of Ruth, so it was just on the mind, or maybe I was in a more somber mood, you know, and so I decided to preach from, from judges and lead us off with a cautionary tale, All right? If you're familiar with the book of Judges, or if you're not familiar with the book of Judges, I should say, Judges is one of the darker and more deeply disturbing books in the whole Bible, All right? It's one of those books, at least for me, that evokes, when you're done reading the book of Judges, there is a heavier, ugh, than perhaps any other book in the Bible. All right, this is the story of God's people after they've entered into the land of promise that God had for them. All right, God had delivered them from Egypt. He led them through the promised land, or sorry, led them through the wilderness and led them into the land of promise that he had for them. And now we are hearing of this new generation that arose that didn't know God, didn't know the things that he had done, and they turned away from God. And, you know, the story, if you know the book of Judges, it's just this unfolding cycle of God's people taking notice of the surrounding, you know, uh, tribes and peoples and the villages or even the surrounding nations and taking notice of the gods that they serve and the religious practices that they involve themselves with to earn the favor of those gods and also noticing what those gods apparently seem to be giving them and thinking, well, man, maybe if I worship those gods, I would get a little bit more of, you know, bountiful harvest or more kids or whatever it is. Right? And so they started crafting worship services to the Baals and to the Ashtaroth, to all the Canaanite fertility gods. And it wouldn't go so well for them. <laughs> right? These surrounding peoples, these surrounding nations, they would oppress God's people. And God was not so happy with Israel's covenant betrayal, and so he wouldn't come to their aid. But then they would cry out. And they would call to God to have mercy and compassion. And he would. And he would deliver them. And then once we're all safe and secure again, they would go running into the arms of these surrounding gods. And round and round we go. And each cycle is sort of like gets darker and darker until you get to the end of the book and you're just knee deep in like these ugly stories of, of rape and violence and then ultimately civil war. And then, you know, the forced subjugation of 200 little girls and daughters. Right? It's just a terrible ending to the book. And actually the last line of the book says... Each one did what was right in their own eyes. And it was a disaster. And so here's the thing, right? If I was part of the older generation, maybe, you know, uh, maybe I was young enough, or I was, maybe I was old enough that I can still remember just a little bit of what life was like back in Egypt. And I can remember how God moved heaven and earth to bring Pharaoh to his knees and to deliver us from oppression under the 
you know, heavy hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. Or I can remember, you know, growing up in the wilderness, which was not easy, very difficult. And yet in that, we learned what it means to lean on the Lord, to rely on his provision and his protection. You know, and then we remember the excitement about coming into this new land and how God drove our enemies out before us and he settled us into this good land flowing with milk and honey. Right, and then maybe, now at the end of Judges, and you see the mess that's been made, maybe this older generation is going to look, look at these kids with a critical eye, like it's so often the case, the older generations look at the younger generations and say, oh, these kids these days, they got no morals, they got no values, they have no respect for their creator. And look what has come of it. Except here's the problem. You go back to our text that we're looking at here today, and it says... And there arose another generation after them, this young generation, who did not know the Lord. All right, and that word for know there in the Hebrew, that could be knowing in a head knowledge sort of way, or it could be knowing with the heart, like a more of an intimate relational sort of knowing. But then this line too, or the work that he had done for Israel. Clearly, that's not just a relational knowing. That's an informational knowing. They didn't know who this God was, and they didn't know the things that God had done for his people. Right? And so the obvious question, <laughs> well, why in the world not? Why not? Why didn't this people, this new generation, understand who God is and understand all the incredible things that God had done for them? Well, I don't know. Probably can't say, well, they were just stuck on their phones all day or they didn't pay attention in their Sunday school classes or whatever. Uh, more than likely, what happened is that the older generation, the generation that had enjoyed all of God's deliverance, all of his provision, all of his blessings in the land of promise, this older generation, as they were busy, you know, in the whole affair of, you know, settling a new land, you know, building a new nation, building, you know, homes, as they were busy doing all of that, somehow, it seems like, what got left aside was one of the most fundamental foundational responsibilities they had, and that was to teach their children who God is and all the things that he had done for them. If you go back into the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is um, Moses' closing book, his final speech to his people before they enter into the promised land. And if you read through that book time and time again, you get passages like this in chapter 4. What great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, such that whenever we call upon him... Oh, sorry. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and make them known to your children and your children's children. Or chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. On and on we could go. Chapter 11. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and you serve those other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you will shut up the heavens so there be no rain and the land will yield no fruit. You should lay there for these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Teach them to your children talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. In other words, I think what we have in our passage is not so much the failure of the next generation that went running into the arms of... I think what you have in this passage is the failure of the previous generation that was so busy doing this, that, and the other that they forgot this fundamental primary responsibility, privilege, and joy that had been given to them from Moses to teach all that I'm giving to you, to your children, and to your children's children. Talk about it during the day. Bind it on your hearts. Right? And in the absence of that, 
well, this new generation is just easy fodder for all these surrounding gods, these cheap knockoff idols, and all the prophets and priests of the surrounding nations and their religions saying that, hey, this God is way better than your God. This God will provide so much more. He'll care for you so much more. Come worship this God. Right? And here's the thing. There are some things that just don't change down through the millennia. Right? One of them is that it is at the core of who we are as human beings, as men and women, young and old, that we are fundamentally worshiping creatures. Right? Fundamentally, I don't think we're just thinking creatures or we're just feeling creatures. But I think in Scripture, fundamentally, we are by design worshiping creatures. We were made to worship the living God. All right? And so there's always like this gravitational pull in our hearts to worship. And if we're not worshiping the Creator God, it's not that we just stop worshiping. It's that that pull leads us to worship other things. Right? There's always this pull in the human heart to identify whatever, things in the broader culture, ideas, things in the creative world that we put on a pedestal and that we look to, convinced that that thing will give to me meaning, security, comfort, pleasure, peace, life to the full. Right? So we make that the thing of supreme value in our hearts. Essentially, we make that an idol and we bow ourselves in worship to it. Right? That's the gravitational pull in every human heart. And not only that, right, so we have these gravitational pulls in the human heart, but then we have a broader culture as well, too, that is full of, or I should say this way, there's a million and one different voices out there telling you which gods, which knockoff idols are going to make your life rich and meaningful and satisfying. Right? It's a current of propaganda, if you want to put it that way, that we can so easily get swept up in. It's like when you go down to the shore and, you know, you're swimming out in the ocean and you're, you know, you're looking out, over the, uh, looking out at the sea and you're just jumping over the waves, you're, you know, picking up the kids or whatever, you're just having a whole lot of fun out in the ocean. And meanwhile, there's this, what do they call it, the riptide, right? That's just sort of pulling you one direction or the other. And you can sort of feel it there. You know it's there, but you don't really know that you're caught up into it until you turn back around and you look at the beach and you're like, where in the world is our stuff? <laughs> And you look down, oh, it's all the way down there. Look how far we've just been kind of swept along unknowingly by this current. I think that's the picture. Right? There's this natural gravity in the human heart to run into the arms of idols. And there's this cultural current that yeah, tells us, no, this is where life is found. You bow the knee to this God. You give yourself to all sorts of religious practices for this idol. And this is where life is to be found. <laughs> Or maybe another example. Oh, my family's going to hate me for this. Maybe not. I, I don't know. It seems like uh, uh, any of the conversations I've had with people over the week, over the past two weeks, has all been about this mysterious a bear that we came. I mentioned it last week in the sermon. This bear that came that we came across when we were hiking out in Montana when we went out to pick up Cali. And it always seems to come up in conversation. And, for some, and so it's surprising to me that everybody knows about this bear that we encountered. And everybody has a, a story of what happened with this bear. So clearly you've been talking to some people or you've been looking, I don't know, social media posts or whatever. If you want my version of this story, and this is why my family is going to... You know, you go into uh, the Glacier National Park or any of these national parks out there, and it's not going to be too long before you come across a sign that says you are entering bear, bear country. And it has a whole list of all these things that you're supposed to do and not do when you come across a bear. And guess which one is first on all these signs? Don't run. Right? Stay calm. So we're going our way down this trail. There's really nowhere else to go on this trail because it's pretty steep going up or steep going down off the trail. And we turn a corner, and sure enough, there's this nice little grizzly bear that's moseying down, I don't know, 10, 15 yards in front of us. And he's coming down, so we turn around. And guess what my family does? <laughs> kind of run. I made in a big commotion. Leave me in the dust. I mentioned that last week. Now, to be fair, though, Maybe they could come back to me and say, hey, you know what? Because, you know, here's the thing. Like, I had been looking into, uh, 
you know, just what to expect when you're hiking. And you know, I'd read stuff about bears, watched some videos on all that. So I had this sort of stuff in my head, and there's the signs. But they could come back and say, you know what? You know, at the end of the day, you never pulled us aside and said, hey, this is what we should do. If you see a bear, it's quite possible. We got to slow down. We just calm down. And I didn't do that. And so meanwhile, in the absence of that, as, there, as we're out there, there's another whole group of hikers that are there. And I don't think they were local Montanans either. They were just all over. And so when they saw the bear, they just took off and said, come on, we got to get out of here. And so it's kind of like my family just got swept up in that. I don't know if they heard me saying, hey, hold on a minute, slow down, wait a But this kind of stuff, in the apps, I don't know. If, <laughs> we, of course I was taking a picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's not every day you see a bear. <laughs> anyway, I was staying calm. I had my bear spray on my hip. I didn't know what to do with the thing. I figured I'd just throw it at it. I don't know, but whatever. Anyway, but there's sort of the idea, right? In the absence, this is the point, in the absence of faithfully undertaking our responsibility to teach our young people who God is and what he's done, Right? The likelihood is that they're going to get caught up in the momentum of the human heart and the current of the culture around them. And they go running in the opposite direction. <laughs> so it's a charge to us as parents, right? It's a charge to us as parents to remember our sacred calling to teach our young people the knowledge, the fear of, and the love of the Lord. To immerse our children in the story of what God has done. Help them to see their own story in light of this bigger story that they're a part of, of God sending his son to lay down his life sacrificially for our sin and brokenness, of him then raising that son victorious over the power of death and throning him at his right hand, and from which he pours out his spirit to help us overcome the power of the enemy. Or maybe I'd say it this way. It is a fact that your children will inherit an idea of God and what he's done from you, for better or for worse. Uh, there was a, this is, this is going back now a few years, but it was still the best study that was ever done, research ever done, on the spirituality of teenagers, American teenagers, it's done by Christian Smith and Melinda something or other. But Christian Smith, he's an you know, important sociologist now at the University of Notre Dame. And they conducted this most thorough research, investigation into the spiritual lives of teenagers and interviewed thousands of teenagers all across the country, all different denominations. And they found two striking things. First of all, they found that all these teenagers, you know, they're part of the Methodist church, Baptist church, Presbyterian church, Pentecostal churches, even Catholic churches, right? So the whole diversity of Christian churches in America. And yet what they found is that all of them pretty much believe the same thing and are living pretty much the same religious system. And they gave this religion of teens a name. And they called it, I, I've mentioned this before, moralistic therapeutic deism. All right? They said the religion of the teenagers, they believe in a God in the way the old deists used to. That there is a God out there, there is a creator, but he stays distantly removed from the affairs of his creation, the affairs of his people. He doesn't get too involved. Where he does get involved is if you need a sort of therapeutic shot in the arm, right? If you fall on hard times, life gets a little bit difficult, you cry out to him, well, he's all too delighted to come to your aid and give you the therapeutic boost that you need. And the name of the game is, you just do the best you can. That's that moralistic therapeutic deism. And the thing is, Right, all three of those points are very distantly removed from biblical Christianity. And so in my early days of ministry, when I was a youth pastor, when that book came out, it was kind of a, you know, it was kind of like a call to say, well, what exactly are we teaching our young people that this would be their system? Okay, but here's the second thing. And this founding was even more shocking than the first one. And what they found was, is that all of these teenagers, they didn't come up with this religion on their own. And they didn't just magically start believing this unified religion, but actually the religion they had was the religion that they had inherited from their parents, right? Because they also went and they asked the questions of the parents and they found that it was the same thing. And what they found was that the religious spiritual lives of these young people were not fundamentally shaped by their peers or what they were seeing on TV, but it was what they inherited 
from their parents. Right? And so the fact of the matter is, the appreciation, the love, the fear, the respect of God that your young people have will be what they inherit from you as their parents. And if you bring them to church on a Sunday morning, you bring them to youth group on Wednesday night, but if then during the week, your life, they can see no tangible difference between your life and the life of the neighbor or the life of their best friend's parents, well, then they might have some head knowledge about who God is, but at the end of the day, they're going to think this God has no practical value or makes no practical difference to my life day in and day out. Or if you're never uh, confessing your own sin, seeking repentance, or you're seeking forgiveness and modeling a humility that is dependent on the mercy and compassion of God and modeling a gratefulness for the death and resurrection of Christ that has solved the problem of your sin. If you're not modeling that and immersing your kids in that, right, they're not going to grow up with a deep sense of the gospel. They're not going to grow up with that humble dependence of the, upon Christ. Understand I'm preaching to myself here. Uh, I got a daughter right who's 17, one more year in high school before she goes off. And so I'm in the game now where I'm starting to think, I'm, I'm, in, start, I'm, in, I'm in regret mitigation mode. <laughs> I got one more year here. So, you know, as I look down the road, are there going to be things that I regret not having done or having done? And I got one, one year here. It's not really one year, but, you know, before... And, and even as I do that, like I'm already realizing that, yeah, on the back end, I am going to have regrets for missed opportunities to just talk more naturally with my kids about the glory of God, about his faithfulness, his mercy, his compassion, or just to rehearse with them the story of what he has done and who they are in Christ, right? So all of us, there's that reminder as parents, first of all, remember our solemn responsibility to pass along to the next generation who God is and what he's done. I took more time on that than I wanted to, but anyway. Okay, but here's the second thing. I want to speak to all of us, not just the parents, or even if you are a parent, I want to speak to you again. <laughs> right? If you read through the rest of the Bible, especially when you come into the New Testament, we talk about this all the time. What is explicitly clear in the New Testament scriptures, is that nobody grows up into maturity in Christ apart from close connection to the family of Christ. Right? Nobody grows up into the mature stature of the fullness of Christ separate from the body of Christ. Right? The body of Christ, the church of Christ, not just a group of people who come together on a Sunday morning, sing songs, listen to a sermon, and then maybe go back out in the world and do nice things in the name of Jesus. It's more than that, right? This is a spirit-empowered body. This is a group that God has gathered together, that he has invested his spirit into, has given gifts to, that have real power, and that all of us are in need of. Right? When Christ draws you into relationship with himself, he draws you into relationship with his family so that he may nurture you, disciple you, care for you within that family. All of us need that. Paul is explicitly clear, whether it's in Ephesians 4 or Romans 10 or 1 Corinthians 12, that no part of the body can ever say to the other part, I have no need of you. The hand can't say to the leg, I have no need of you. I'm okay. I got this on my own. You don't. Paul is explicitly clear. And the simple reminder point that I want to make to you is that the young people also need the life of the body. They need that body life. They need that power of the spirit-filled body of Christ in relationship and in ministry together. I mentioned when I started off in, in ministry, I started as a youth pastor, youth director um, at a Bible Fellowship Church out in Royersford. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a music major in college. So, you know, I went back to seminary and tried to learn as much as I could about young people, about ministry, and also about youth ministry, too. I had, you know, I was just curious questions, you know, how youth ministry developed and I found some uncomfortable things as you, you look back into the history of youth ministry in the church. Uh, youth ministry in the church is a relatively new phenomenon. That's probably like mid-1900s it came about. And the way it came about, all right, how do I sum this up real quickly? So in the 20th century, you know, about mid-20th century, you had this sort of separating that took place between the older and the younger generations, right? It used to be 
way back in the day, right? You went, you worked in the fields with dad or you worked in the home with mom or maybe you would even go back, you know, in the early 1900s, young people would go to the factory with mom or dad and work alongside, like their lives were much more conjoined, right? You get into the middle of the 20th century, public school is becoming more robust, there's child labor laws. No, you can't go to work when you're only 11 years old. You gotta wait on that, right? And so what happened is those lives became a little bit separated. And as a result of that, the teens, you know, or the young people started to develop their own culture, right? As they were spending more time with one another in schools or wherever, they were developing a, a new culture that was sort of different from the culture of the generations prior. And the thing is, the churches weren't ready for that. Or they weren't ready to embrace sort of like a missionary mindset with this new culture in their own church. And so they weren't I don't know, speaking the language of this new culture. They weren't answering the particular questions that this new culture had. And this new culture, these young people were starting to flounder. So along came some mission agencies, some parachurch agencies in the United States said, well, we're going to go after these teenagers. So you get groups like Young Life or Youth for Christ and saying, hey, we're going after these teenagers that the church is not really addressing. And so they started having these fun events after school where they would get teens together and they would I don't know, do fun things. They would sing songs. They would, you know, share God's word in a way that was meaningful to them. And it was working. Kids were coming out to this. They're bringing their friends and they're growing again. Well, don't you know, churches started to take notice. They said, huh. You know, our kids are going to that over there. Meanwhile, they're not sticking around here. Maybe we should do what they're doing in the church. And so they started developing these programs that look like Young Life and Youth for Christ, right? These fun, exciting events and activities where people would come together and you'd play games, you'd sing songs, and you'd sit under God's word in a, word in a way that was relevant and meaningful to them. And the young people started to grow again. But here's the problem. The problem was, and we were starting to see the effects of this when I got into youth ministry is that what that model essentially did is it created two congregations or it created a parachurch within the local church or as some would call it, it created a little ghetto where we shuffled off our kids and our teenagers. And sure, they were cared for by teachers, but the broader body of Christ, the broader, broader family said, yeah, I don't need to worry about that because those youth teachers are taking care of them and they're getting served in their own little mini youth church going on over there. And the problem is, that's no good. The young people need the body life of the whole congregation. Now hear me out, I'm not saying that youth ministry or children's programs are not okay. No, they are, they're great tools. What I'm saying or what is dangerous and what is a terrible mindset for a church to ever settle into is that, oh, the programs are taking care of the kids, so I don't need to reach out. I don't need to invest. I don't need to get to know these young people that I don't know anything about. I don't need to go rub shoulders with these strange teenagers and every, whatever. We got programs to take care of that. Well, the other thing we found in youth ministry in, in my years, or actually in all the years of my ministry, the telltale sign of whether a young person was going to graduate and stick with the church or come back to the church was always contingent on how good of a job we had done connecting that young person to the broader body of Christ. Right? And that's just the challenge for us this morning. It's just to make sure that every one of us here we own the responsibility, not just of caring for them, brothers and sisters who are in my age group or my peer group or whatever, but man, even more so that we own the responsibility, all of us, of taking our gifts, all that the Spirit is doing with us, and pouring that back in relationship to one another, and where which includes our young people. Again, I'm hoping this is just reminders. But it comes with a challenge, right? Like if by chance... I don't know, you're here, and if you're thinking back over the summer, or maybe you're thinking back over the past six months, and if by chance you think back, you know, I don't know if I had a meaningful conversation with a child in this church, or a teenager, where I was getting to know a little bit about them and their story, and I was sharing with them a little bit of who I am and what God's doing in my life, I would just ask you not to be okay with that this morning, and maybe make it a goal in the next couple months, hey, 
I want to get to know one of the children or one of the teens in this church that I don't know. Right? Maybe you sign up to be a prayer partner. I'm sure Fuzzy would love to get more people signed up for that. Or maybe you invite that family over to your house for dinner. And as you're sitting around the dinner table, you just strike up conversation with the kids and you get to know them or whatever. Or maybe you get their sports schedule or their band and orchestra schedules and you show up at one of their concerts or whatever just to build relationship. Right? Simple things. But it's just that, that call, that reminder to all of us to make sure that we are always caring for the young people in our care that God has entrusted to us. Right? Are we on the same page? <laughs> Simple reminder. Okay, last thing. I'm going to close it up. Just a quick word to the young people. If you're a child here, if you're a teenager here, and if you have entrusted your life to Jesus, and Jesus has claimed you as his child, and he has put his Holy Spirit within you, and he has gifted you with that spirit, I just want to say to you that you are immensely valuable to this congregation, that we need you and that giftedness. I remember sitting with Joey and Leah and right all these folks that wanted to be baptized. And I said, hey, you understand that when you get baptized, you're not only declaring your identity with Christ, but also your identi identity with this ragtag, broken, sinful, no offense, you know, church, family. And you are pledging not only to receive the ministry of the body, but you're pledging to take what the Spirit has deposited in you and contribute that back in service and ministry to the church. And I just want to encourage all of you, we need that. If you have the Spirit of the risen Christ in you, we need the giftedness that he has given to you. If you have the Spirit of the risen Christ in you, we need the passions, the convictions, the things that he is teaching to you. We need your boldness to live as a follower of Christ in a secular world with a group of people that are all just following that current, running after these cheap knockoff idols. And we need your excitement, your enthusiasm. No offense to our greeters here, but some of my favorite greeters are some of our young people. Man, those Blondie boys, when they, they make you feel like the most important, or, or the, the group of teenage girls that sometimes sit over here and clap for people when they're coming in. I mean, that's just kind of weird. Probably freaks people out. Probably some people left. But it makes me feel great. I love it. And... We need that excitement. We need that passion. We need whatever the Spirit is working in you in ministry here as much as you need us, right? And so I would encourage you to come to worship with a submissive heart that's ready to receive what comes to you from the body. And I would encourage the rest of us as well, too, to come with submissive hearts ready to receive what the Spirit is doing in the lives of our young people. Oh, look at that. It's 11.15. I wanted to get out a little earlier to give our children's workers a break. It didn't happen today. There's so much more we could say about that, but I want to close it with this. I never like to close a sermon saying, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that, here's what you got to do, and shame on you if you don't. Always important to bring it back to the God who has already done the work, and, and we're just participating in his work. And I would just remind you the way the book of Judges ends. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes because... There's no king in the land, right? And, and, you know, so Judges is kind of like this segue between all these messed up, corrupted judges in the book and, and First Samuel, you know, which, where you start to get the king, David, Saul, right? And then really the rest of the whole Testament it, or is, you know, the story of those broken, corrupt, failed kings paving the way for the New Testament like for this longing for a, a righteous and faithful king who will lead God's people into life to the full. So you turn that page into the New Testament, you're introduced to this guy, Jesus, who the first words off of his mouth are, hey, repent, turn around, because the kingdom is here. Because I'm here. The king is here. And, right, and so as we go at this as parents, investing in our kids, as we go at this as a church, caring for, taking notice of our young people, Right? We do it recognizing, thankfully, we are not in the situation of the judges where there was no king in the land. Right? We're in the situation now where there is a faithful king in the land. The king who has already solved our deepest problems in sacrificing his life for our sinfulness. The king who has already broken loose the power, the chains of sin and death, who has overcome the enemy and who leads us in overcoming. And the king in the land who makes promises to his people that he who began the good work will bring it to completion in the day of Christ when he returns, right? And so we rest in that. 
we find our motivation to participate with the king in that, and we lean into that victory of the king for our strength and for our power to do this faithfully. So may God lead us in that, lead us in faithfully what he calls us to, and together, young and old, growing up into the fullness of the measure of Christ. And we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.